Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited to have you here for our AI4 webinar series. Today, we are talking about the state of AI for legal, and we are so excited to have all of you here. Before we get started, one quick housekeeping item. Please make sure that you put all of your questions in the Q&A box as opposed to the chat. This makes it easier for us to organize your questions so that we can get to as many as possible. Uh, but please ask as many questions as you'd like. We'd love to get your thoughts and uh, be able to engage our panelists. So without further ado, I would love to welcome our panelists to the virtual stage. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. As Patrika mentioned, uh, we have a wonderful panel here today. We're joined by four amazing panelists. I'm Daniel Lathan. I'll be moderating the panel. And like Patricia mentioned, if you have any questions, just drop them in the Q&A feature down below, and we'll get to them towards the end of the webinar. Without any further ado, let's go ahead and kick off self-introductions. And Daniel, I'm hoping that you would kick us off here with a brief introduction of who you are and why we're together on the legal webinar panel. <laughs> Sure, absolutely. Um, my name is Daniel Rose. I'm a partner with Foley and Lardner and a member of the firm's electronics practice group and technology industry teams. I'm a former engineer and a patent attorney, and probably 90% of what I do is patent prosecution in the areas of software, and about half that these days is artificial intelligence based uh, across all industries. I, I do a lot of AI for financial tech, uh, medical diagnostics, manufacturing. So I'm, I'm really heavily involved in the modern practice of AI and interested in it both uh, professionally and then how it can help my practice. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, Tyann, you want to take it away and give a self-introduction? Yeah, sure. Hi, Tyann Patel. I'm a partner at Baker Hostetler located in, in our Washington, D.C. office. My practice focuses on IP-centric transactions and strategic counseling on patent development, monetization, and risk management matters uh, in a variety of fields. Um, most importantly for this topic would be emerging technologies, high tech, um, and I also do life sciences work as well. Uh, my practice, um, I do a lot of work with AI, um, particularly with clients in that space, but also I use AI tools uh, in my own practice. So I'm looking forward to sharing some, some uh, useful information about that. Thank you very much, Tyann. Andrew, you want to kick off a self-introduction? Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Uh, Andrew Medeiros, Director of Innovation Solutions at Troutman Pepper Hamilton Sanders here in our Philadelphia office. I'm a recovering attorney. Um, I help our attorneys and our clients uh, look at new people, process, technology solutions to help them practice you know, more efficiently, more effectively. You know, a lot of it really listening to our clients finding the right uh, sort of pain points that we can alleviate and finding the, the technology and processes to, to address those. Excellent, thank you so much. And certainly uh, last but not least, Mike, you wanna give an introduction? I am Mike Wong, I'm a solutions consultant here at Disco. Um, the one person on the call that's not part of a law firm right now, but I've been in the legal technology space for about 15 years now and actually started on the firm side and just always was very, very uh, much involved in the, the deployment and implementation of technology at law firms. Uh, I made the switch over to the software side of the equation about 10 years ago. And since then, I've just been working with firms around North America and figuring out how they can leverage not just AI solutions, but also uh, leverage their people and their processes in a better way um, so that they're working more efficiently. Excellent. Thanks so much. Well, uh, I think I speak for all the attendees. We're very excited to have you all here today. Patrika, would you like to jump into question number one here? Um, and Andrew, this is going to be coming over to you to start, if you don't mind. So the question is, how much adoption of AI have you seen in the legal field? Please offer examples as to how widespread AI technology's usage is at this moment in time. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a great question, Daniel. And, you know, it really varies, I think. Um, use of AI and legal throughout the industry, you know, is really context specific. I think we have, you know, certain areas like in the e-discovery space and in Mike's world um, where, you know, AI has become commonplace. It's, it's everyday use. It's, a, it's, you know, part of everything they do, uh, especially for like our eMERGE uh, subsidiary, you know, they use uh, technology assisted review on a day-to-day -day basis and that's, that's what they do. Um, on the other hand, we've got other practice areas, you know, where it's still a growing um, part of the, the practice, 
And so, you know, if we're looking at due diligence and trying to speed up doc review um, in that space, it's, it's been, um, you know, a slower road for adoption, uh, but we're making that uh, part of our, our processes. Um, and then, you know, the, the new frontier, what we're looking at next is trying to figure out, you know, the best ways to extract some of the, the latent knowledge that we have in the documents we produce for our clients. So, you know, populating our, our um, you know, data systems with data points from the contracts uh, without having to have an attorney actually write down each individual um, data point on their own. Cool. Thank you so much, Andrew, for that intro. Um, does anyone else want to jump in here in terms of, you know, what they're seeing, how prevalent AI use is, uh, where they're seeing it make an impact and where maybe they're not? Well, I, I think Andrew, Andrew mentioned e-discovery, right, where it's it's pretty much a requirement now in many cases to have uh, technology assisted review because we're dealing with such large corpuses of documents now um, that having AI enabled platforms just allowing you to, you know, increase the throughput of an attorney going through those documents uh, is just something that you have to do at this point just because of the cost considerations around it. Um, what I will say is that one of the shifts that I've seen over the last year or so is how we can uh, use that AI in ways outside of technology assisted review within the litigation life cycle, meaning that we can do things now like leveraging AI between databases. So we can have you know, one database spin up, you can apply all of your work product into it and then use those learnings from that database on a similar matter the next time around, right? So you're not reinventing the wheel every single time you're creating similar types of cases or similar types of databases. So you've been able to do those things. And then there's downstream effects as well, where in the litigation world, you know, producing privileged material is kind of the, the worst thing in the world that you can do. Um, and so we're able to now leverage AI to identify potentially privileged documents um, by just kind of going through and coding them. And I think I know we're going to talk about success later, but part of the recipe for success in this adoption of the AI is the fact that it's much more accessible now than it was, let's say, five or six years ago, right? It's much more integrated into the products that we're using. It becomes a lot easier for a lawyer, whether they're somebody who's comfortable with technology, like the folks on, on, the, on the call today, or folks who are not comfortable with technology, they're, they're, they're able to access it and, and use it, even if they don't know that they're using it. Excellent. Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. Uh, Dan or Tyann, either you want to jump in here on prevalence of AI uses and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just jump, jump into it from, from the perspective since we, you know, Dan, I manage clients uh, at law firms. And so, you know, there's a, there's a cost component here where, you know, our clients are demanding and they are very sophisticated clients who understand that, you know, document review can't entirely be done by attorneys and that you do need AI services in order to speed up the process. At the end of the day, um, we're all service providers to ultimately the client. And so, at, you know, with that, we just have to make sure that, you know, we're delivering the best product you know, at the best value we can. So we have to um, be looking at these AI tools in order to stay um, on their radar. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think, uh, you know, 10 years ago, you would have had a, a room full of first year associates doing doc review and, and just piling through thousands of documents to classify them and categorize them. And one of the things AI systems are really good at is document ingestion and classification. Uh, and, and particularly with, you know, where, where you've got these predefined categories and building that corpus of knowledge, it's, uh, you know, much more efficient. And, and I think definitely uh, the industry is moving that direction. And I think one thing that Mike said that I wanted to sort of jump back in on is, is that idea of using AI without knowing it, I think is going to become, you know, more and more just a part of day-to-day -day life uh, of a lawyer, um, you know, in the business of law specifically, um, you know, in your conflicts checks, in your time entry, in all of the day-to-day -day things that aren't practicing law, and there will be AI there too, but I think the more and more we can take the technology and integrate it into those processes more seamlessly, I think, you know, we'll get to adoption later, but I think that'll go a long way. And I think we're starting to see that with different vendors. We, we call it the Netflixification of, of AI and legal, um, where not just in doc review, right, but across the board, the idea is, hey, you know what, if you're, you like this, you're gonna get more of it, right? If, you're, if you log into Netflix, it's gonna tell you what you wanna watch next based on what you've watched so far. 
And while the AI and legal is definitely much more um, complex and robust than that, that's just kind of simple metadata extraction. Um, what we're doing uh, on the software side is trying to figure out ways that we can replicate kind of your, you know, your commercial grade experiences with the software tools you're comfortable with in your professional life, right? And so, you know, going back to that idea, right? We want to make sure that you're able to embrace the AI, and you may not even know that you're using it. And I think the most obvious example of that is dictation software. You know, and people are using that every day. You know, talking to your phone, talking to Alexa, talking to Google, and and. Yeah, it's that's all AI driven under the hood, and that. But but you don't tend to think of it that way. You think of it just as dictation software. But you know, even even five six years ago, uh, dictation software was terrible. You had to manually train it for hours just to get a sort of reasonable product, and so most people didn't use it. So yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the more the more we become used to it, I think the more comfortable everyone will be. We don't even think of it as dictation software anymore. That's just what my kids yeah. call a computer. Like they just, it's the computer. They talk to it. That's how it works. I saw and I think that for a long time we we're just overcomplicating it, right? And so just simplifying, simplifying the process and simplifying the, the solution, right? AI does not need to be, you know, what we're doing is you're saying, you know, it's the shiny object, it's the thing that everybody wants to have. It's you know, part of that echo chamber that everybody's just talking about AI, similar to like cloud. Um, but if we, we break down what AI is, right, it can be that simple chatbot, you know, call and response. Uh, it can be just augmented intelligence. It can be the form generator that runs a little simple math equation in the background to give you your, your, your calculation at the end. It can be a whole host of things. And so what I recommend everybody like who's attending this webinar to do is don't just think about AI as kind of this singular thing, right? Think about what you're trying to solve. What's the problem you're really, really trying to solve and break it down from that point and work backwards. Cause then you can apply technology to it. You can apply people to it. You can apply process to it. Um, but without understanding truly what you're trying to get out of it, um, you might have, you know, we, we've seen it time and time again. I'm sure everybody on the call has seen this where you acquire technology and then it just sits on the shelf, right? Those are things that we want to really avoid. Excellent. Patricia, you want to jump into question number two? All right, so you all just talked about a bunch of different uh, use cases and potential use cases. Um, so the question is, what challenges or difficulties do you see or anticipate when it comes to the adoption of AI-driven technology uh, in the legal field? And Dan, I thought your perspective on this uh, might be really cool and relevant to, to kick us off here. Yeah, I think one of the biggest difficulties is uh, managing expectations. Um, you know, for a couple of years, there've been sort of scaremongering articles in the legal industry uh, papers about, you know, uh, AI systems will be coming along and taking our jobs and they'll be doing the document drafting and preparation for us. And really that doesn't seem to be happening, nor is it really likely to happen. Um, there was a effort a couple of years back to build a prior art database uh, using an AI system that would extract uh, sentences from existing patent applications and publications and, and piece them together and turn it into a giant body of knowledge that, you know, theoretically some can search and say, well, everything's in here. It's, you know, it's one piece of prior art. But the resulting output was just terrible. It was unreadable. You, you know, every sentence, because it was literally pulled from other patent applications and publications that were unrelated to each other, they wouldn't make any sense in context. There was no story there. So you'd have something saying like, you know, in some embodiments, the third position can be a benzene ring. The housing can be metal. The packets can be compressed before transmission. It, and it just didn't make any sense. And where current AI systems are going, and, and they, they do a little bit better than that, but still the output doesn't really tell a story. Uh, it, it's very mechanical. You can build very good boilerplate quickly with an AI system based on your existing boilerplate, but Patent applications and document generation really requires some some thought and some creation of really new material. And, and so I think, you know, that that's one of the challenges getting people to manage those expectations and say AI is not going to replace your, your first and second year associates. Uh, what it can do, however, is replace the mechanical tasks that people spend a lot of time on. So again, document ingestion and classification. Uh, docket management, uh, docket ingestion, and, and you know categorization of office actions, for instance, and, and the patent prosecution side. You know these are all things that can be done by someone with a training of a couple of weeks, and and there's not really creativity going into it so much as it is a mechanical task that can be trained. And I think AI systems are great for that. So it, it's really sort of that limitation in targeting 
the AI system to something that it's really good at, as opposed to the the wishful thinking of, of you know what, what maybe you hope it can do, but it really won't be able to. Yeah, thanks so much, Dan. Mike, I think you also wanted to weigh on this one, especially uh, as well. You want to talk about challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the threat of efficiency um, and that, you know, kind of the law firm model historically has just been based on, you know, hourly billing and that that's where revenue is generated. And I think, Tyann, you, you mentioned before that, you know, and clients and, and corporations are getting much more sophisticated around all of that. And so um, we also on the law firm side would need to get uh, better about how we manage our time. And so, you know, Dan, you mentioned that, you know, there, there is a lot of, you know, hoopla around, you know, the, the robot lawyer coming to take away the first and second year associate job. And, you know, part of the conversations that I have to have is that I think it's the inverse of that that's actually going to happen. Because if you're doing manual work, right, as a first year, first and second year associate, uh, a lot of that time is likely going to be written off. Right. And so your billable hours will decrease significantly as a result. Whereas if you were to leverage AI uh, to help you get through the manual tasks, the rote and repetitive much, much faster, you'll actually be able to dedicate more of your time to the, the quality work. The reason you went to law school, right, um, to, to the actual practice of law. And so that, that's part of the challenge that I have as somebody who's on the, you know, the software side of it uh, in, in kind of you know, encouraging folks to use the AI, not because it's going to take away your job, but because it's going to allow you to do the piece of your job that is actually going to matter in the next few years. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I, I spend so much of my time uh, managing associates workflows, uh, covering bills, putting my own time. And, and that's not time when that that's not my best spent time. It's not time when I'm, I'm using my brain. It's it's just wasted time. And so absolutely, AI systems are perfect for that. I think right. the other big challenge that we have to overcome often is the black box. Um, you know, getting our attorneys comfortable with understanding what did the technology just do and why did it do it? So I can give, you know, advice to my client about it. Otherwise, if we're just, you know, throwing technology out there and saying, trust us, they're not going to trust us. Yeah, I just wanted to add to Mike and Daniel's point about, um, you know, what AI can do and, you know, what is, I guess, the role of an associate uh, moving forward and, and the challenges now, you know. So for now, I mean, I think AI is, is good, but with limitations, like Dan mentioned, with respect to being very robotic in trying to, um, you know, draft, say, a patent application um, you know, it can only do so much. And I think understanding what the limitations are and, and where the associate, where their role comes in, which would at currently would be to, to tell a story, uh, something that AI just can't do yet. But um, fearful to some extent, the day when, you know, AI can do that. Um, but certainly I think what, lawyers are trying to do now in terms of AI is, is understand that, you know, aspects that AI can't do would be to, you know, be creative or to have some certain types of judgment or to be, um, or to exhibit empathy. And those are in fact, some traits that humans have that AI doesn't have. So it's, I think a mix between using AI for, you know, for its intended purpose, but then um, the final solution or drive home to a client would be still done by an attorney. And, and I think there's law firms now um, that I've heard of um, that are in fact um, testing associates when they come in, in terms of their, um, you know, their empathy, their creativity and their judgment understanding that that is the final solution to drive home and that AI may, may in fact do uh, everything else. Excellent. I completely Thank agree you with that. And I think, sorry, Go I ahead, was going to chime in really quickly. I, I know we're getting to story time later, but uh, I'll, I'll be sharing a story about uh, just that, right? How, how we are, you know, through AI enabling uh, lawyers to have more time to build their stories, right? To understand and build their strategies around their cases. Um, but yeah, I completely agree with that. And going back to what Andrew was mentioning before about the black box, 
Um, you know, I think that that's absolutely one of the hurdles that, that we have on, on the software side is that, you know, we, we have AI um, and it does things and you can agree or disagree with it. So there's some comfort there that it's not making the decision for you. Um, but at the end of the day, the only way for us to verify it is through uh, running samples, right? Running statistical analysis over data sets and um, maybe present company excluded, uh, but I went to a liberal arts school and then to law school because I absolutely hate math. And so whenever numbers kind of come to the equation, that actually becomes a real challenge with a lot of the folks that we speak to um, simply because we're throwing statistics out and percentages out and recall scores out. Um, and that's a whole nother layer of training on top of trying to get people comfortable with AI. Uh, so it's absolutely one of the challenges that we have to face. Yeah. Thank you all for your perspectives. Andrew, I actually had a, a question for you. I thought you might be um, well positioned to address, which is, you know, something that hasn't really been brought up specifically is the cost of AI. I mean, AI, you know, can be costly to develop yourself or to purchase uh, some sort of uh, product and, you know, being on the innovation side, um, in the legal area, I'm curious how it is that you maybe prioritize certain AI projects versus a different AI project, considering how expensive it can be. I mean, is this something that you were thinking about? Yes and no. Um, we are thinking about the costs. We are thinking about the expenses. We are thinking about um, the value that we can provide. But I think it's that that final one, the value that we can provide, that is sort of forefront in our minds. It's trying to solve so, so, sort of solve problems that are repetitive and valuable, um, and then figuring out the right way to scale it and spread the costs after. Um, you know, we look at innovation as you know, in some ways, we're the R and D team, and we you know obviously can't do everything, and we can't you know have unlimited budget for everything, um, but we're trying to find the best way and the right way to do something. Um, and then as we look at reaching scale and you know, billing clients for it on a sort of a more matter by matter basis, uh, operationalizing the new technology, that's gonna move out to somewhere else in the firm like we are, you know, eMERGE our subsidiary um, or specifically into like a business development team if it's more of a business of law type of an aspect or somewhere else. Um, when we actually start to, to look at the, the final bottom line dollars and cents and really make sure that we've monetized everything properly. Excellent. Thank you so much. Patrika, why don't we jump to our next topic? Okay. And Tyann, uh, I'd love to have you kick us off here to begin with. Whenever the question flashes, there it is. Okay. The question is, uh, where do you see the opportunities for AI and legal? Example, please. Examples, please. Yeah, sure. And, and I think we've been touching on this in, in the previous questions, but anytime there's an, for me, an opportunity arises when my job uh, becomes easier and we're able to pass on value to our client. And so uh, in terms of that, I do a lot of work with um, sophisticated clients who are, are looking to um, either purchase a portfolio of IP or to sell a portfolio. Uh, when it comes to purchasing a portfolio, what I'm looking at is value in the IP itself. And currently what we, what we have to do is, you know, we obtain data um, from, you know, either the internet or through some third party, but ultimately we have to do a lot of the legwork in view of assessing each IP asset that comes on board. You know what? What I would like to see, or an opportunity, is is more technology in the AI space that will help um, help me come up with an assessment that hey, this is an asset that is um, lower value than perhaps another asset, or collecting maybe five or ten assets at one time, assets in, in plural, and saying well, collectively they are high value, low value. Um, or somewhere in between. And getting some of that data up front at least allows me to take, um, instead of a uh, 100 assets coming down to perhaps 10 or 15 that I think are the most valuable. It's either something for negotiation to drive down the price or just understanding whether it's a target that you know, we even want to entertain. Uh, so on the, on the due diligence deal work side, I think that's very important. Um, 
I also think that there's a lot of value. We were talking about like patent applications being very robotic, mechanical right now. You know, I, I would like to see applications at some point, you know, have a little more creativity in terms of telling a story. Um, and maybe there, you know, there'll be applications where, you know, the algorithm is looking at, a, you know, specific kinds of patent applications that were written before, well written that did tell a story and tries to mimic that. You know, that would be really in, insightful. Um, also, with, you know, preparing appellate briefs or just, you know, briefs in general, petitions. I think that there's, there's enough data now to suggest that, hey, well, if you have a particular fact scenario, at least portions of your brief could be, um, you know, could be automated. And I think that would save a lot of time. Yeah, and Excellent. I think for, for me, what we're talking about is finding where there's volume finding where there's enough volume and enough value to justify the investment, you know, whether it's AI or, or sort of more standard technology, but bespoke solutions being built out, we need to have volume and value that justifies the expense. Um, you know, if we think of, you know, one of the things that our firm does is, you know, these complex multi-district litigations and, you know, we like to think that they're unique and they are, they're unique. Um, but if you sort of zoom in or zoom out, you know, whichever you prefer, um, you can find the pieces of it that can be routine and that can be volume based. And then you can build solutions, AI or standard technology solutions to assist with those pieces. Um, you just have to figure out what is going to happen over and over again and what is going to have a routine to it. And then we can build something to support that and supplement the, the attorneys on that. I'm, I'm skeptical about AI systems being used for for creative document management uh, preparation, uh, drafting of patent applications. Because, because like Tim, I've said, going back to telling that story and, and being creative in that way, that that empathy I think is not there, and I don't I don't really see AI developing that. Uh, however, uh, that said, there are a lot of documents that are not really so much creative documents as sort of more mechanically pieced together. Um, you know, relatively straightforward contracts, purchase agreements, e even where those do have some, some you know, real creative aspects to them, there's also a lot of pieces where they're just sort of dropped in manually. And uh, you know, piecing together that boilerplate, I think, you know, that's something easily can be done by an AI system to prepare. You know, in, in patent prosecution, we deal with a lot of uh, uh, responses to rejections from the patent office, and, and frequently, you know, they're based on shells. And these shells, right now, we've got a, a team of people that make them manually. But that's the sort of thing where an AI system could easily scan a document, figure out what pieces need to go in there and put that in. Uh, one, one other area that occurs to me in, in really all of these is sort of taking a step back from the actual document work uh, to, to budgeting and looking at the, the request coming in and the ingestion of these documents and giving an estimate saying, in the past, when you've worked on things like this, it's taken this many hours, or this has been budget for, or this has been the number of people you can farm it out to. And being able to early on come up with a, an estimated number, you know, based on our past performance, I, I think that would be really helpful and is something that an AI system could could easily do. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Dan there. Um, the the one thing that I was going to say is kind of the tremendous opportunity that I've seen, not just here at Disco, but in my past life at Neotologic, which was not e-discovery at all. Um, is the idea that AI is really gonna force the hand of the law firm and the corporation to get smarter about their data and how they manage it. Um, because what it'll allow them to do is to structure the data to feed into an AI system so that they can get those insights that Dan was just mentioning. Uh, without the data to be brought into a system, the AI is just not gonna work. Um, and so I think one of the, the downstream effects of embracing AI and legal, right, is the idea that the data has to be good too. And so we have to come up with ways of structuring it better, about intaking it better, about managing it better, which is, you know, just really kind of awesome to see. You know, I know, I know, Andrew, you know, your role is, is, you know, sprouting up at every firm um, because it's so important and critical to get our arms around what the firm is doing as a whole uh, to drive better decisions. Excellent. And just to touch on that, um, Mike, Andrew, anyone else who wants to jump in, I mean, what sort of investment when it comes to money and time is necessary 
to organize data, to structure data into something that is usable for an AI system? I mean, what does that look like typically? I mean, I think it, it depends, right? For, from my perspective, we view everything as the investment and whether, you know, what, what the criteria for success looks like on the, out, on the other side. Uh, and if those things are aligned, then it makes sense to make the investment. Um, you know, at Disco, it's, it's really not a heavy investment at all because it's just, again, we were talking about it before, making it simple, right? It's, it's embedded in the product. Uh, so if the lawyers are doing their work, they're training the AI. This, the, the data goes directly in and starts training the system automatically. Um, in other spaces I've seen, right, in other platforms that I've, I've you know, worked at in the past, uh, it, it is about being deliberate and being strategic about what data we're intaking so that we can go ahead and create solutions on the back end of it. Um, and so the ROI there is a little bit different to calculate um, just because there is, you know, upfront cost for that. Yeah, thank Massive. you. Massive is my answer. Um, you know, it just takes time. It takes people, it takes effort. Um, and especially like this time of year, um, getting attorneys to sit down and do anything that's inherently not going to be a billable task is a nightmare. What do you think, Dan, Tyann, agree or disagree? <laughs> I don't know how you got them here. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's difficult. Um, you know, we're, we're, for better or worse, really driven by billable hours. And, uh, you know, asking someone to devote 50 or 100 hours to help training a system and, and massaging data and make it the right way, even if the promise is, you know, this will save you 200 hours next year, it's, it's tough to get that sell. Um, but I think that will come. I think, you know, particularly there are going to be some firms that are, are a little less driven by that billable hour and willing to experiment to, to move ahead. And they'll be the market leaders and people will see that and start saying, oh God, you know, we, we need to follow them to keep up with that same efficiency. Um, so yeah, I think it'll definitely happen. It, it's, the industry has a lot of inertia, um, a lot of slow moving inertia frequently. And, and, but there are always people who are willing to experiment and be on the forefront. And I think that we tend to follow them eventually. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Dan. I mean, so I mean, law firms are are very slow moving with many with many aspects, and you know, the billable hour. I mean, until you know the the billable hour is is you know augmented to some other type of model, you know, I think it's going to be very challenging for uh, younger associates to want to do work that you know doesn't get built. Yeah. You know, ironically, uh, AI systems and, and analyzing work output and budget and, and cost and, and efficiency time. Yeah, it's one of the things that AI systems could really do. And so AI could be used to move us away from billable hours as being our main metric. So yeah, there's an opportunity right there. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it almost seems sort of like an impossible task, right? I mean, you have, uh, you have a lack of trust around AI systems. And yet, in order to integrate a system into being common practice, you have to dedicate a lot of time to do so. And so without the trust, it seems really difficult. Um, seems like a very hard challenge. Patrika, why don't we jump to the next uh, topic, actually? Okay, so the goal of this question is just to, for anyone who's listening, who's a partner, who's at a law firm, um, just to share some sort of relevant story uh, about these topics. Um, and... I'd love to have Michael uh, kick us off here, Mike. Um, so the question is, please tell Tori, uh, excuse me, please tell a story about a time when you implemented an AI project that went really well, um, or you worked on something that didn't go well and what the takeaway was, what you did, that sort of thing. All right. Well, because I work on the software side, I'll, I'll tell the success story with, with the AI, um, <laughs> and how, how it led to fantastic results. Um, so I, I was working with an AM law firm here in New York. And uh, their client was a, a major insur insurance carrier. Um, and the insurance provider um, had a very kind of old school methodology of e-discovery. Um, and the idea was we're gonna run search terms over our collection and you're gonna review the remainder. Um, and so we were left with about 200,000 documents to review. 
And you know, the 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 kind of the overarching theme of it was, you know, we don't want to review all of these documents, right? We certainly can, you know, hire an army of contract lawyers to go at it at you know X number of dollars per hour, and you're going to get a monster bill at the end of the month. But if we're a little bit more strategic about how we do this, we can use Disco's AI um, to really make sure that we're, we're we're driving an efficient result. And and so they said it's fine. You can go ahead and you know prioritize the data set, do whatever you need to do. Uh, we had already run some sampling over, it, and we determined that their search terms were pretty poor. Um, in that we we had with 95% confidence understood that um, the population was about 5% responsive. Um, so way over collected. Uh, we knew what we were looking for because the AI told us very, very quickly. Um, but in terms of how did this turn into a success, right? Um, when we spoke with our client, when I spoke with you know the end client, we said, look, what does success look for, like for you? Like if, if the AI was successful, what would it look like for you? And they said, well, double, double your throughput, double the productivity of a lawyer, right? So in our eyes, that means mathematically, we're going from five documents relevant out of 100 to 10 documents relative, re, uh, relevant out of 100, right? And for us, that's easy, right? Um, the AI is powerful enough in e-discovery platforms to drive much better results than that. And so what happened was we started prioritizing on day one and our review team was, was going at it. Um, and on day one, 85% of the documents we looked at ended up being relevant, right? So we went from an expectation of five out of 100 documents being relative uh, relevant to 85 out of 100 being relevant. Um, and so on day two, it got stronger because the AI just reinforces and gets stronger. Day, day two, it was 90% relevant. And then the curious thing happened on day four, right? It dropped off a cliff because we had found all the relevant material in four days. And so the impact there, because of the AI, what happened was that the law firm had 99% of the relevant material for their case in four days, right? The insurance insurance company still wanted us to review all, all of the documents, uh, which we did, and that took us over seven weeks to complete. But in four days, our client had all of it, right? And so going back to what we were talking about before, those lawyers had an added six weeks to be creative, to tell their story, to build their strategy, as opposed to you know opposing counsel who maybe didn't use that sort of technology. Um, they would be reviewing those documents throughout those seven weeks, still piecing together what was occurring and having all of the additional costs as a result of all of that. Um, so just a very kind of simple story about how we, how we leverage AI, right? In a way that's seamless, allows folks to do their jobs in a, in a much more efficient way, get the stuff that matters faster. Um, and then, you know, obviously the end client was thrilled um, at the cost savings as a result of all of it. Um, so just kind of all the different pieces of the puzzles came together with that. Excellent, thank you so much. Anyone else wanna jump in and tell one of their stories? Yeah, I think Mike's story is really interesting because it's not always about cost savings. Um, it's not always about efficiency and you know working faster or spending less money. Um, sometimes it is about just doing it better. Um, or in my case, in my story, doing it at all. Um, we had a, a document review for a, a big corporate reorg that we were working um, with the client on where you know they had tens of thousands of documents, not necessarily the 200,000, but tens of thousands of documents, contracts that you know they were going to basically you know accept the risk of you know reassignment and figure out you know how they're going to um, you know restructure their organization um, without necessarily notifying all of their counterparties in all of these contracts because of the cost it would have taken to review it all manually. So, you know, if we had to do it manually, they were willing to take that risk and they were going to take that risk. And instead we, we use an AI tool to, you know, analyze those documents, get it done in a couple of weeks and give them that comfort and say, all right, we don't need to review all of the documents. We're going to review a portion and then it's going to tell us where similar um, clauses are in the other documents and give you that peace of mind without necessarily, um, you know, having to review every single contract, put eyes on every single contract. And it's interesting because, you know, it really shifted my thinking when talking with attorneys, because again, you know, in this due diligence space, at least, um, our attorneys always think of it as it's going to cut down on the billable hours. It's going to cut down on how much we make on matters. Um, and this is an instance where the client was willing to take the risk. So we were going to get 
no hours from it. And instead we use this technology. And so even if we got 10% of the hours that we would have gotten for a full review, that's more than we would have gotten with no review. And so it's actually, you know, efficiency can drive um, new pathways to revenue and new pathways to business that some clients are in certain cases willing to risk, but they don't have to anymore. Amazing. Thanks so much, Andrew. Dan, Tyann, you want to jump in? Or sorry, Mike, did you? No, no, good. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let the other guys go before um, I hop in with a, a non-document sure. review story. Great. I mean, I'll give a, my perspective from, from the law firm um, side of things. And so, yeah, I mean, cost is usually um, always a concern for our clients, particularly our institutional clients. And, um, and this just happened recently, uh, this past year. In Q4, um, clients tend sometimes uh, decide that they don't want to spend as much, uh, you know, in view of their budget. And so we had a very sophisticated client uh, in the IP space for one of the um, portfolios that I manage. And, and they actually said, well, look, give us, you know, give us your um, assessment based on a limited budget of the best cases to tackle for Q4, right? And yeah, we could have just given, um, you know, the list based on what we have done and the hour and spending hours to do that type of assessment. But we, in fact, um, use software tools that kind of tell us and use some sort of predictive behavior of examiners and the likelihood of success potentially of specific cases that are moving through, you know, the USPTO's you know, prosecution system. And, and using that predictive behavior, we were able to um, prepare a strategic assessment of the portfolio, provide key assets that we think would um, actually be successful in Q4. In-house counsel's major objective was to achieve a certain amount of allowances or grants of patents for this year. And, and we were able to at least deliver that type of solution to them uh, and it's ongoing. So uh, to be continued. Well, I'll check in back with you in uh, six months. <laughs> um, Dan, you wanna talk at all about any sort of story, good, bad, medium? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 two quick ones. Uh, one, we, we use um, AI systems that essentially uh, review patent applications after the drafted, but before they get filed, we, before they're locked in stone and we can't change anything, uh, to, to make sure that uh, claim terms properly appear within the document, that we're using the same numbers throughout and everything. And those are AI systems. I mean, it, it, they're policy and rule checkers. But uh, they do need to take into account a lot of the context of the document and what's going on, semantic analysis. And they actually do a pretty good job at that. So it's, it's one area where we've been uh, uh, quite happy with them and quite successful with them. And they've probably saved us a lot of time and embarrassment. Uh, you don't want to file something that has some obvious errors in it because that's the sort of thing that the clients get really upset about paying for. And, and so avoiding that makes us look better. It makes our, our output product better uh, and, and saves time and uh, costs for the client. And so those have been really successful. Uh, on the other side, I've also, we, we've got a system that uh, is theoretically supposed to help with uh, billing and time entry uh, that looks at the time that we spend uh, make, writing emails or using our phone and, and builds time entries for us for our billing system. Um, but it doesn't really work that well because if, if you check an email on your phone, it doesn't count that or sometimes it counts it partially and, and gives you the wrong number. It doesn't really build narratives into it. it it's, it's an example of uh, a system that was created, but not really tested well, it seems, because uh, it, it doesn't, doesn't work for a lot of the use cases that we run into. Uh, and, and frequently, its output is just useless. So it seems like, you know, there, there's definitely opportunities there, <laughs> possibilities, but it's not perfect yet. Definitely. Mike, you wanted to comment, I think, on a, a previous story. Do you still want to say something? Yeah, just just really quickly. I think, you know, for, for folks who are attending, um, I, I would assume that, that some are kind of in a boat of, you know, where, where do I start with AI? Um, and so my recommendation is always, you know, if, if you're not in litigation, not in discovery, to start start with something that, that's relatively simple that you can solve using automation um, or, or kind of, you know, 
AI, AI tools. Um, and I, I had a client a long time ago who, who was trying to do that. And she had this kind of very manual process of identifying staffing for her, her teams. And so she would get a random email from a senior level lawyer at the firm and it would be bulleted and they'd go back and forth through email about the case, about the timelines, about the needs, about the budget, all these sorts of things that were just completely unstructured, right? All this unstructured data through email. And then she would take all of those points of data, feed it into an Excel calculator to get an output of like what she needed. Um, and so we used an AI technology to automate that entire process, right? Where it became a form on the firm's website, the lawyers could log in, they filled in exactly the criteria that was needed, no more back and forth. Uh, it ran all the calculations for her. It ran it through her entire vendor panel to see what was approved at what price points. And what she got was a single email saying, this is the request, here's who we recommend using based on all of our weighted calculations, do you wanna move forward, right? And so being able to automate that was very simple. I built the application in about 20 minutes, um, but it solved a huge headache for her. And so to those you know, on the webinar, I highly encourage folks to think about kind of those, those tasks that are, are you know, at your firms uh, or at your, your various businesses that you can, um, automate, right, uh, through the use of, of an AI tool. Great. Thank you all for telling your stories. Uh, Patricia, let's jump to the final question of the day. Okay, so this is about the future. The question is, what do you expect the future of the legal field to look like as AI technology continues to expand? And Dan, uh, I was wondering if you would kick us off here with your perspective. Sure future of the legal field. Um, what I would like to see is, and, and this you know, may not be the best answer for, for some of the assistants that I work with, but uh, a, a more leveraged uh, system with assistants be better able to manage a larger group of lawyers. Um, I think a lot of where AI can, can fulfill those promises are, are many of those rote tasks uh, you know, document ingestion and management, time entry, uh, preparing bills, sending out emails, routine emails, reminder emails, things like that, that right now we, we have assistance doing. And it takes a lot of their time uh, and a lot of effort, but it is something that is perfect for automation and, and really should be automated because it, it'll also, you know, potentially catch mistakes or errors before they happen. And it would allow them to achieve the same workload or better uh, for a much larger group of lawyers, and and in the same way that we you know try and try and build the firm as a pyramid with with a few partners and more associates and then even more junior associates and then there's a big group of assistants managing everyone or helping manage everyone, uh, trying to cut that down so so that it can be an even broader uh, system with, with with fewer fewer people supporting more people, uh, and I think that's where AI will will probably go. And it will make uh, law firms a lot leaner as a result and more efficient. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dan. Anyone else want to jump in on their thoughts about the future? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll piggyback off Dan's comments. Um, when it comes to billing, um, most folks will say that's probably in, in the legal industry uh, for lawyers, they'll say that's their biggest pet peeve is that, you know, we, we still have to review all our bills and we have to edit as needed before those invoices, in fact, reach a client. And so if we can make something more seamless where, um, you know, the work looks, uh, the work product is completed uh, and then invoices are, are generated either on demand uh, because some clients expect that or, um, or monthly, then um, that would save us uh, as lawyers a lot of time every month reviewing bills. Yeah, and my vision is sort of, you know, continues down that path and just continues to grow and, and sort of expand. I just want it to work. I just want attorneys to be able to do their work and not have to think about everything else and not have to do everything else and not have to do it or mark it down three different times. You know, I'm thinking of, you know, you've got the business of law aspects of billing time and you've got, you know, legal project management and you know tasks lists and emails to clients and emails to partners and you know an associate who writes a memo a has to write the memo then they mark it off on whatever their task list is that they did it then they write an email to a partner and then they put it into the time entry system 
when in reality there should be some system that knows they wrote that memo, that alerts the partner that it's there to review, that then alerts the client that we're done with it, and then you know tracks the time that they did and has a approved narrative that we know the client likes, that we know the client will accept, that is descriptive of what we did, and just you know tidies it all up and sends it all out. That's my vision for the future. I don't know when we're going to get there or how we're going to get there, but it's a, it's a lot of different systems all working together because you know, you've got to be parsing your outside counsel guidelines to know what your clients want and what your clients expect. You've got to be you know, doing something like Dan's firm's doing where you're listening in basically on what technology the associate's using when they're writing the memo. Um, you've got to get everybody using the same tasks lists. There's a lot of challenges um, that we're going to have to address at the same time. Um, but we're starting to be able to see the outlines of where that might be able to happen and how that might be able to work. So I'm, I'm getting a little excited about it. I guess my, my vision from the, the software company side of the, the equation um, is twofold. First, uh, my hope is that in the near future, um, the blue robot in everybody's blog posts will go away. Um, I just feel like it's, again, it's creating, making AI just seem like this unattainable, shiny object in the room that just, you know, everybody wants to use, but doesn't really know what it is. Um, and so kind of getting rid of that, right? Bringing it back down again to the simple, uh, the, the fact that it can be intuitive, that it can be useful. Um, that's kind of what my hope is for the near future, right? For, for adoption of AI. Uh, the second is, I think, kind of what we are doing on this panel, right, is that we have folks from very, very different backgrounds on this particular panel, and I don't think that something like this would have occurred five or six years ago. Um, historically, what's happened is uh, we've just kind of been an echo chamber where, you know, folks who are on the software side of the equation, uh, folks who are, you know, in, in Andrew's roles and, 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 you know, things like that, legal ops, we all kind of speak to each other a lot but we're not out there speaking to the actual folks who are practicing law, right? And we're not really um, measuring what it is that you need from us um, to, to build products, right, that you want to use. And so my hope for the future is that, you know, while Disco, we, we feel like we do that, um, you know, other companies will get involved with that, right? Understanding what it is that lawyers need out of technology so that we can build the products that you guys wanna use. Um, and so that, that's kind of my hope for, for the software side of the equation. Yeah, it's, it's funny. We're, we're not looking for AI systems to replace what we do because, you know, at least theoretically, we got into this business because we wanted to do this and, and hopefully enjoy what we're doing. Um, but there's a lot of aspects that, that aren't really the creative legal work and getting rid of those, that would be like my ideal. If I could... I could spend all of my time doing creative, interesting, billable legal work and, and never touch a, a billing system. Uh, that would be perfect. Amazing. Well, we're almost out of time. If anyone else wants to make one last comment about the future uh, or the present day, we can do so. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up in just a moment. All right, it has been an amazing webinar. Thank you all to all the attendees from joining and we'll hand it back over to Patrika right about now. Awesome, thank you all so much. This has been incredible. And I know this virtual audience is going wild with virtual applause. I can't Woo. see them, but I can definitely hear them. <laughs> so thank you all so much for sharing with us today. Um, and for our audience, we thank you so much for joining us today. And we are so excited to continue to bring you awesome content about AI so that we can continue to share these insights with you. So please stay tuned for more content coming your way this year and next. So thanks so much, everyone, and have a wonderful, wonderful day. We'll see you soon. Thank you, panelists. Take it easy. Thanks, everyone.